Aloha and welcome to Figments, the power of imagination here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm always excited to be back. I'm really excited today because I'm a master of the obvious. And when my Top Gun related shows are the two most popular shows in the history of Figments, the power of imagination, I know to build on that. So I'm going to build on it today and uh, hope to inspire and entertain by uh, acknowledging the 50th anniversary on Wednesday. Uh, this year, 27 of July, 2022, of the great F-15 Eagle, an airplane that I flew, and so did my guest. And we're going to talk about, of course, a Top Gun-related uh, topic. Imagine being in flat spin. Of course, you're not headed anywhere but straight down, uh, not out to sea. And that's an allusion to the uh, the line in the original Top Gun, 1986 version, where I think it was Iceman who says, Mav's in trouble. He's in a flat spin headed out to sea, which makes every fighter pilot worth his salt roll his eyes. Well, my guest today has been in a flat spin headed straight down to the desert in the mighty F-15. Colonel Mike Talent. Mickey T, brother. How are you, man? I'm doing good, Fig. Great to see you again. It's been too long. It's been too long. We're going to have a big claw, claw, claw and world famous highly respected triple nickel reunion. In November, uh, I had Keen Eye on a couple of weeks ago. I hope you get to see that. It's going to be great fun because we'll renew our friendships and uh, reminisce about this wonderful airplane we got to fly. Hey, before I start, Mickey T, I want to acknowledge somebody that Figments has allowed me to reconnect with, and that's Master Sergeant Retired Ron Rotten Ron Enriquez, who is the Air Division and Fighter Wing Flagship Crew Chief when we were at Luke. And... Uh, and we talk a lot about pilots because it's fun and entertaining and inspiring. It's the, the shiny end of our business. But guys like Rotten and Ron and Gals now uh, made it possible by giving us airplanes that are ready to fly and in good shape. And so Rotten and Ron, I'm thinking of you, man. Someday we'll we'll get together again. But it's good to be reconnected. So Mickey T, I I got to fly a bunch of different airplanes because of when I came in the Air Force in active duty in late 1974. Here they are up in the upper left-hand corner, the double ugly F4 Phantom. I started life as a as an F4 front seater. Uh, then did a tour in Korea flying in the upper right, the OV-10. Not as mighty, not as sexy an airplane. And after almost 2,000 hours in the F-15, I wound up as an F-16 wing commander twice. And that's me in the lead airplane, the top airplane on the picture. That's that's a pretty cool picture for a, for a Viper picture. Uh, but Mickey T, you were an eagle baby, all eagles, all the time. That's true. I uh, graduated from the academy in 83 and started flying uh, eagles at a pilot training in UPT at Williams, which no longer exists there in Arizona, um, uh, Phoenix, space, yeah. and went to Luke and got trained uh, in 84 in the uh, triple nickel uh, in Initially, I was going to Langley Air Force Base, and I don't know if you remember, but Langley, we had an air-to-ground dock uh, back in uh, 84, 85, so I did the... In other words, folks, bomb dropping. The F-15 bomb dropping, was primarily air yeah. air at the time. So we were air-to-air, -air, obviously, that was our primary mission, but we'd spent many a time uh, dropping uh, B-words there at Air Force Air. Uh, and kept that for almost, you know, uh, three years before I think the Air Force said, what do we really got the Eagles doing here? And they took that dock away from us and we went back. Well, to I, I don't know. I, I didn't know that about your time at Langley. I do know that when I was at Kadena, we had several of the most experienced IPs, me, uh, Jack Cat, and a bunch of other guys who were qualified air to ground dropping bombs. We called it sport bombing. Because exactly. we put two inert 2,000 pound bombs on the airplane, go out and, and drop them somewhere on one of the island targets, and then go do the real mission of the F 15 air to air. So I didn't know that about you. You're slightly unclean despite 3,500 hours of air right. security time. 3,500 hours, very proud of that in the F-15, um, multiple assignments. I mean, some great deployments uh, went to. Um, what was Accord Express? We went to Alborg, Denmark, when I was at oh, wow. for a full month flying against the Norwegians, and that was back when there was an East Germany and flying off the coast of uh, Denmark in a very small airspace over the water. 
where you get in trouble going to Swedish airspace or going into East German airspace. And we didn't have all the situational tools we have in the mighty yeah. eagle as it's evolved, but uh, obviously- No GPS? Tools. No but GPS, I, I, we didn't know situate, you know, not the miss up uh, where you had the situation display where you could see where you were. You had, you know, your tack in and, uh, that, and your eyes to keep yourself out of trouble, which, uh, it didn't give you perfect essay all the time. So you'll remember for this from when I was your ops officer and commander, I'm leaning in now and saying, son, you don't know what it was like. Because I was flying the OB-10 in Korea with basically a compass, so uh, whatever. But you're right. It was a, a different time. Still, the F-15 was a, a an incredible leap in aircraft. We'll talk about its performance in combat later. But you wanted to fly the F-15 long before you did because it was the new airplane when you were probably in high school right yeah i was uh well i was in high school and you know i wanted to fly fighters my dad was a naval fighter pilot he flew a4s off of carriers in vietnam a couple tours off the uss hancock you know in the gulf of tonkin and there's some other stories you can talk about a different day uh his experiences there but um, I was accepted both to the Air Force Academy and Naval Academy, and he asked, you know, if I'm sure I didn't want to go to the Naval Academy, and I said, no, I've always wanted to fly the Eagle, because the F-15C was known as the best fighter in the world, uh, and to get to that, I had to go to the Air Force Academy, and it was close. I grew up in Denver, so just went to Colorado Springs, kept my nose clean, did well, and did very good at pilot training. And there I was uh, at Luke in the triple nickel learning and touching the, the mighty eagle. Trigger alert, folks, all of you fighter pilots who aren't F-15 guys, just, you know, take a chill pill or something because the very best fighter pilots wound up in the F-15. That's undeniable um, and record demonstrates. It was the first new fighter in the Air Force in a long time. If you look at the performance, of the pilots, the airplanes, the pilots as officers later. Sorry, we were an elite crowd. We didn't feel elite. We just flew, felt like a bunch of fighter pilots, but what a group of talent. And when I think back to our time at Luke that we'll get to, you and the younger generation, I, I said in our warm up discussion, you are a different breed of fighter pilot. You're eight, nine years behind me. And uh, I came in right after Vietnam War. We're kind of junkyard dog fighter pilots, you know, uncouth. Not that you can be uncouth. I know you can because I've seen it, but um, you guys were cool. You were, you were kind of maverick-like and you all good golfers. And you also flew the daylights out of the airplane and, and took the airplane to uh, to a different level because we were you know, conditioned by our experience flying F-4s as I did or A-7s as others did, like, you know, um, and so it was an iterative process for us. For you all, it was an expansive process into getting everything you could out of the airplane. And at some point that can get you in trouble, but we'll save that for just a few minutes. What do you remember about your first flight in the, in the Mighty Eagle? Let's maybe first solo, but Think back to the first time you, one of the early times you flew that awesome airplane and, and well, how it struck you. Yeah, I remember, you know, like I said, I wanted to fly it since high school. So there was multiple years of, of wanting to finally do that. So when you finally were at Luke and there it was, and you know, you're sign, you signed out and you're, you know, walking to the jet, you know, and you're gonna get to fly this thing. And it was big and it had big engines and it had an amazing capability. And you were, was a little bit of, you know, tipping your hat to, wow, I, I'm here and I want to learn how to fly this to the best of my ability. And I think that goes back to what you were saying is there was a lot, you know, in 84, 85, 86 timeframe, some Eagle, the uh, first assignment guys or Eagle babies that were very, very good pilots that were learning how to fly it. And I think we learned from each other. We pushed each other. It was was like I think of as a sports team for a lot of camaraderie, a lot of competition, mm -hmm. a lot of you got to do better and better and better. And I think that's what made us even a stronger fighting force with the Eagle, not only the Air Force capability, but the pilots that were flying it and our ability to always make ourselves better and push ourselves to be better and better. 
um, tactically, employment of the airplane, and, and the airplane obviously evolved. You know, the airplane that we yeah. flew in 85 compared to what it is now, I mean, the weapons have changed, miss up, fighter data link. I mean, it is a totally different animal, even though it looks like an eagle on the outside. You got an ESA radar versus an APG 63. It is so much more capable, even though the outside looks the same. And that makes you but, as a pilot change. You have to evolve and learn how to employ it. But it's still the F-15. It, which is that's all good and there was some status to that because we flew only air superiority airplanes against other airplanes with the exception of those who quietly secretly <laughs> did the unclean bomb dropping thing but we that's were true. supposed to be the best at air to air and you felt like every where you went every sortie you flew you ought to be able to kick somebody's pardon me viewers ass and there was great pressure to do that and it was a healthy pressure that made the that made the community better that squeezed every last drop out of the airplane that we could i'm going to go through very quickly some pictures of your time in in the f-15 here are some kind of family there that's you in your office getting some gas from a kc-10 <laughs> right looks like right. you that is me it is you and it's a big airplane like you said my first viper combat sort of sort of combat over iraq i pulled in the army area next to a an eagle up at Insert like went. That's a big airplane. It was the first time I ever felt like the Eagle was a big airplane. You've got yeah. some great family shots. Uh Steph is always in the picture. I look forward to seeing both of you guys in Arizona. Uh, but that's nice. We'll talk more about that later. And then the bottom right hand picture uh, has special significance to you and to me, because I also commanded a famous fighter squadron, the world famous highly respected triple nickel. And that's the, the day that you took command of the 94th Aero Squadron, Eddie Rickenbacker Squadron, the Hat and the Ring Gang, the, the exactly. Spaz. How yes. did that feel? Share, yeah, a lot share, of pride. Why the world's greatest fighter in this incredibly historic squadron? How did that feel? It felt it felt great. I mean, it felt uh, you know a uh, culmination of a career, even though it wasn't the end of my career, but it was a lot of responsibility. A lot of great people in the squadron and uh, a lot of history, like you said, in the squadron, there was pictures of Eddie Rickenbacker and all the kills they got in World War One, you know, and you just saw the history there and you wanted to continue the legacy and, and make sure you did the best you could for the squadron. And that was back, you know, when we had maintenance together with the operators and it was yeah. one, a very tight knit group, which I was lucky enough to take to war with OIF which was probably, you know, that's a great experience when you take them yeah, and command, you get very tight. Man in combat, and, and you can hate war and love being in combat, I think. But there's, sorry folks, if you haven't been there, can't explain it. We gotta make sure we save time for your flat spin here, T. So let's quickly look at a couple of more pictures of, uh, those are Finney flights, the uh, end of a tour and uh man the the joy of flying that airplane with the kind of people we got to fly it with and reaching the successful end of a tour uh awesome a couple photos of of you and the guys you flew with these are four pretty shit hot fighter pods if i may say these these are some pretty good aviators that you got to hang out with. uh very good aviators cans uh then we got uh Boomer Brown and Flash Dean, you know, so, yeah. yeah, I mean, like, that goes back to what you said. We had very, very high talent in the F-15 in all assignments, you know, great people. Yep. And uh, Willie Tell team, we won't dwell on this, but uh, I got to acknowledge your your neighbor there in Yorktown, Quaker Oaks in the middle. This is the William Tell team at, at Langley. And... Uh, William Tell's Worldwide Weapons Beat, the best get us chosen for the team, um, and the chance to focus on being the best drives you to, to new levels and to try new things. And so after your Langley assignment, not the one that picture is from, but after the, Lang the Langley assignment, your first assignment, the F-15, you came to Luke, where I was an ops officer. I think you got there in 90, 1989. Ish. 88 actually 88. 88 yeah so you you man you quick turn from, from a brand new nugget green bean in the f-15 to being a formal training instructor quick turn 
Um, so you must have been doing pretty well. Yeah, I mean, I was an ID at uh, at Langley, which I, I don't think was the norm. His first assignment. Folks. First assignment, and then I uh, got to go to Luke, and now we were all instructors. And again, you know, kind of the cream of the crop got to be, you know, go, you know, F-15 to F-15 and go to Luke. Uh, and then we were teaching new guys, you know, what we knew, and uh, we were learning from each other. You know, there was the attack aces at Luke. So when we yeah. were flying real planes, we could go down and, and just attack each other and do BFM, you know, until we couldn't, you know, you'd come out Basic of the fighter maneuvers plant and just, you know. So, uh, let, let me let me uh, elaborate a little on that. TAC aces was a high fidelity maneuvering, maneuvering simulator where it performed very much like the airplane it, it, that happened to be at Luke Air Force Base right across from the squadron, a couple blocks maybe, uh, that we were in the 426 killer claws, claw, claw, claw. Mm -hmm. And uh, Fridays on occasion, we'd go over there and and uh, because you couldn't hit the ground or each other in the F-15, we'd go just ring the sim out and, and look for new ways to win, new ways to win, absolutely driven, voraciously competitive. I still remember Gunga beating me. I'm still mad about that. That was 30, 40 years ago. That's um, right. It, it, but it drove us to new levels. We were flying the airplane like other people weren't flying at that time. And, we were definitely um, pushing it to the limits. We were pushing it right up to the edge. And we got very, very good at it. I mean, very good at very it, good. right on the edge. And that's where you flew it. And you had to because... If you didn't, the other IP and the other jet would beat you. So you had to fly it to the edge. <laughs> so you couldn't yeah. have that. And so I was a, a later, uh, the operations officer number two in the squadron, trying to keep these wild men, very talented wild mm -hmm. men, from doing something stupid while they were pressing the envelope. And they, they did their talented, but you still have to have reins on the horses. And we'll get to when when that came to manifest itself in a minute. But first, let me talk about uh, where you can find Figments, the power of imagination in my earlier commentary show, Figments on Reality, on playlists on YouTube. So give you a minute to take a happy snap of those QR codes, the new darling of the pandemic. And uh, please come look at some of the episodes. I will be on in two weeks again, and probably another flying related story because they seem to be working for the audience. And I'm all about uh likes because i don't get paid for this so that's what it is so i've got another picture of you and steph uh mickey t that that's a great one it's the quality isn't good this is you coming back from uh operation iraqi freedom right that's correct yeah we had a bunch of media and we've been yeah. deployed for five months which is longer than i'd ever been deployed and uh you know, waiting for the war to kick off. And when we came home, we brought all the jets home, you know, all our spouses and everyone came out. So Stefan, my family came out and, you know, we were interviewed by the, by the media, but it was great to come back and, uh, you know, see everyone back home after being gone for a while and having a very successful deployment where we brought everyone back safe and sound. Yep, that's, uh, that's the key, bringing everybody back. The reason I show that picture is we don't have a picture of probably an even more emotional reunion with Steph. And that came on March 15th, 1990. Now, folks, we are finally to the flat spin headed to the desert story. Uh, Mickey T, I was the ops officer of the 426th. I was told uh, on the 15th that I was going to get to be the commander of the world famous and highly respected triple nick. I'm pretty happy about that. Went to play racquetball with Smurf Reed, who we'll see at, at, uh, in Arizona at our reunion shortly. Five points into the game. Boom, 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 sir. You got to get back to the squadron. We just lost a jet. Holy moly. <laughs> that was you. That was your F-15. That was a smoking hole. Tell me, what was the mission? What did you go out intending to do? Well, it was it was going to be a student mission. And I think for some reason, the student was uh, either Deneuf or it wasn't available for the sortie. So, um we had uh, Pickle rolled in, and we just did a BFM sortie, two instructors, continuation fight. training. Uh, and I uh, said, hey, I'll be defensive, so I'll be flying defensive. He'll be flying offensive in a normal BFM ride. So that was the mission that we briefed, and we went out to execute as two instructors in the Gladden airspace just, uh, just west of the loop. 
Yeah. Well, so there you are. And what they're doing, folks, are called perch setups, where one pilot is in a defensive position, the other pilot's in an offensive position. Boom, boom, boom. Achieve certain parameters, fights on, and the pilot who's defensive tries to not be defensive, and the pilot who's in a an offensive position tries to achieve shot parameters and claim a kill, which as the defender, you didn't want Mickey T. So this was what, 3,000 feet of range? Yeah, it was 3,000 feet. The way the first setup was a mile and a half, 9,000 feet. And and I did well, I survived. And then the second setup was a mile, 6,000 feet. And once again, I survived. So I was feeling confident that I was doing well yeah. as a defender. So that the most challenging is 3,000 feet, a half a mile, where there's not a lot of reaction time because the uh, offender is in weapons parameters almost immediately. So you have to be very aggressive to survive and get out of plane so that he's not able to employ the gun against you. So that's the setup. We're about 18,000 feet, you know, right about 400 knots. Altitude. Yeah, 18,000 yep. feet of altitude. And the ground there's about 2,000 feet, I think, or something like that, or just under. Okay, so fights on, fights on. Got to miss that radio call. That's and right. you start your defense, what happens? So I do, you know, immediately a 120 degree slice, idle, stick in the lap, as aggressive as you can go, out of plane down to avoid being shot, you know, and then uh, I look back and Pickle is rolling behind me, you know, not going for the kill immediately, trying to stay behind me as I'm slowing down aggressively because I'm an idle. And then uh, a quick, not very much longer, I rotate another probably 90 degrees vertically and pull the stick in my lap again to go almost pure vertical to try to just cause a, you know, problem with Pickle getting too close to me so he has to get away from me and then I'll have more options. And as he's starting to get close, where I'm saying, okay, he's too close where I can reverse and cause a V sub C or a, a problem with him getting too close where he's gonna have to move away, I'll be able to neutralize and get at least in a neutral, you know, maybe rolling scissors or something like that towards the floor. So I start to reverse to the right. And remember, I'm very nose low now and slow on airspeed. I'm reversing mm -hmm. to the right, pushing the right rudder, full right stick, full right aft. And this I see, is a lot like the movie, folks, only yeah. it's real. And I but see you're maneuvering, you're off. getting everything you can out of the airplane to try and, to uh, force the guy who was going to shoot you out away from you and gain the advantage. Go ahead. And so as I'm starting to make this maneuver, I see Pickle react and start to pull away, which is good for me. I'm like, okay, he's too close. He's having to reposition. I'm gonna have some time to survive and do something else. Well, just about the time my nose is starting to track in that direction, I just, I remember distinctly the, the intake smashed straight up. It was a loud bang, like they just went flat, like if the plane wasn't flying. They're normally the engine down. intakes, which are by each shoulder in the F-15. Exactly. So it's a loud noise. And then the departure tone starts to come on as I start to go to the left. And I'm kind of thrown forward in the jet a little bit. And I remember just kind of letting go of the stick and not touching anything. Because as you remember, as instructors, yep. we would take our, our students out on confidence rides and basically do tail slides. We would take it to zero yep. knots and it would fall back and the jet would quasi depart and do some crazy things. And then it would always recover. And we would always say, see, the Eagle was so safe, you know, it's going to recover on its own. It, it's, it's stable yep. and you can do amazing things to the airplane. Well, anyway, so I was just like hands off. So don't touch anything as it's the departure tone's going. And so I go a spin or two, and Pickle actually said, he, he as he pulled off, and then he rolled back to look at me, he saw my nose had come all the way in, and was tracking him, and he was like, how the hell did he do that? What are you saying? <laughs> he was up in his mind. Yeah. And then he saw my nose continue to track, which meant I was, you know, I'm out of control. I'm in a spin. And so I go a spin or two, and then I take the stick and go full in the direction of spin, which is the anti-spin uh, controls we're supposed to put in. And I remember consciously looking at the altimeter and seeing, you know, 10,000 and change, you know, and my face is kind of forward in the, 
because of the outward eye forces, mm -hmm. you know, the forces are pushing you away from the center of gravity. Um, and I hang on for a turn, another spin or so, and I look at the altimeter again, and, and the, the departure tone's on. I'm not here seeing anything that's indicating it's coming out of the spin. And I see it's going towards 8,000, 8,000 and change. And uncontrolled ejection altitude there, I think, was 12,000. Yeah. So I'm well below that, and it's not doing anything. And I consciously in my brain, I'm saying, I got to do something here. This is, you know, this is bad. Is what I basically say. So I so it, you're you're got to do something. Mickey T is eject, but four years earlier, there are three. Yeah, four years earlier, it had been Top Gun where poor Goose hits the canopy in a spin ejection. But but also there was an Eagle accident where the pilot. Uh, I don't remember if it was the canopy or the airplane, but in any case, where the pilot was killed during an out of control ejection. Did you hesitate or was it just, no, I got to pull the handles. I'm out. Uh, it was, it was just instinct. It was instinct on what we were trained on. But I remember the previous guy that you're talking about, I think he hit his head on the seat and it yeah, caused a brain something. injury and it was a significant injury. But anyway, I, so back to my situation. So when I made the decision, so I let go of the stick, just push my head and back, back in the seat and pulled on the handles. And it was immediate. All I remember is like a flash. And then I was in a shoot. It was that fast. It was like, I don't remember even really going up the rails. It was just really? like a flash as the canopy departed. And then I was in a shoot and I was looking down and I saw that the canopy kind of flying off one direction. But right between my legs, I saw the eagle just in a flat spin, just right between my legs. Spinning like, oh. like a top. Let's spin it like a top, just like I'm looking at it. You know, part of me, maybe I'm in shock and I'm like, oh my God. You know, so I'm kind of watching this and then instinct comes in our, our training, you know, canopy, visor, mask. Yep. All the stuff that we're supposed so to do. So we're going to, because there's so much to talk about, I'm going to fast forward a little bit. You, you're quickly, you land, you're safe, but the airplane is not so safe. There are local authorities to pick you up and they fly you back to Luke. You get back to Luke. And what was the first thing your bride Steph said to you when she saw you in the hospital? You dumbass. She, she, no, actually, that it? No. she saw me when I got off the helicopter. They pulled me out of the helicopter that came from Yuma. And of yeah. course, they had told the EMTs on the ground that yeah. happened to be on the highway that he might be in shock and he might have broke his back, even though he says he's okay. So I was on a backboard you know strapped down even though i was fine and so you know she just kissed me and said uh, am i okay i'm glad or i'm thank god you're okay and i said i'm fine and then they took me in the hospital so that was what she said you know and so, we're uh, we're there. Uh, we met you in the hospital we brought pizza and jeremiah weed as i recall which was That's not right. a medical protocol we we're all happy that you were alive we're you know the f-15 is an extraordinarily safe airplane Really, and I looked through the list of all of the mishaps, and uh, most of them are mid airs, which means yeah. we're flying the airplane aggressively in air to air training, still tragic, but but a very very safe and reliable airplane. When you got back to flying after the accident, um, did you think about that at all? Did you did you have the heebie jeebies a bit about what of the airplane departs? I, you know, oh, were I, you didn't, good? We're just cool. I didn't think I was going to have that, but I remember Kenai said, hey, Mickey T, and I flew two days after I ejected, which is yeah, pretty remarkable sure. considering yeah. all that I went through and I wasn't injured and I, it was like, hey, mm -hmm. get back in the jet. And Kenai goes, hey, my uh, Mickey T, we're going to put a, a pilot in your backseat, uh, an IP. He goes, you know, it's nothing against you, but it's just someone back there to kind of that confidence factor, you know, and I'm like, what? I don't need, you know, but when I went back out there. Because <laughs> we are a single seat fighter pilots by guys. Right. We did have a couple two seaters because, you know, we were yeah. training but. You know, students. So we had a couple, but um, we, uh, it probably was a good idea because it was, you know, after falling off the horse, you know, getting back on, right, it took right. a little bit of time to get my confidence back. Cause I, you know, I had had over a thousand hours in multiple assignments and I didn't think there was anything I could do to the jet to get myself in trouble. I, I couldn't get out of. And then after ejecting, you know, you're kind of like, 
well, that kind of went away, and now I need to be a little bit more cautious here. You know, this right. thing could, it, could go sideways. Yeah, it is such such a great airplane. What they found was, I'll summarize because of the clock, what they found was that when the airplane was originally built, it was a 7.3G airplane, 7.33, and that uh, the, uh, an improvement called the overload warning system allowed us to fly to 9Gs. It's not quite that simple, but you could get to higher angle of attack with more energy. You used to be able to get to higher angle of attack with low a low energy state, but they'd never tested this way, and it was more likely to go into a spin like you described, um, and, and like you experienced. You didn't describe it; you lived it. Yes. And, and so eventually, you're let off the hook, but you had to feel like you were on trial a little bit because. Because you departed it, the initial board president said you'd done something with the flaps. Turned out you didn't do that. But did you feel like you were under the gun, waiting for the accident board to figure out what happened? Well, initially, you know, I didn't do it. I didn't think I did anything wrong. But but then, like you said, they were asking, "Hey, you didn't have your flaps yeah. down," and I was like, "No, that's a, illegal. I didn't have any flaps down. We don't fly with the flaps down at BFM." Um, but then, uh, evidently, because the plane pancaked straight in, and I saw it pancaking straight in, you know, when it hit, the flaps broke down. And so it burned because of fire, you know, after it crashed. But it, you know, when the initial uh, interim board president went out there, whose job is only really to secure the site, he looked, it looked like, hey, the flaps were down because they, they broke. But And so they were asking a bunch of questions about the flaps. and. You know, they didn't until they tested the actuators, they wouldn't have known where the flaps were down. And they weren't. Of course, they didn't offer that to me right away. Right. They didn't tell me that as soon as they found out. They just let me kind of hang for a while. So then your mind starts playing games like maybe I accidentally hit the switch and then the flail or whatever. But, you know, they weren't down. So that was good. So just so you know, you weren't the only one kind of hanging there because I had been told, as I said, I was going to be a squadron commander. And now they need to make sure that as the ops officer, I hadn't screwed that job up. So the my assumption of command was delayed or change of command. And uh, and I told the wing commander, told, told me about this flap concern. Uh, and this is a lesson, folks. This is a little leadership lesson. I feel good about having said this. He said, oh, hey, you had the flaps down. I, went, I don't think so, sir. I think, I think I'm running a good operation here as the operations officer. And and if I'm wrong, I don't deserve to be a squadron commander. So let's see what the mishap board finds out. And they were right. You guys were flying the airplane to the edge of the envelope. And that led to that that max performing of this mighty F-15 Eagle 50 years ago on the 27th, 50 years old on the 27th of July, having a 104 to zero kill loss rate in air to air combat. The airplane has never been defeated in aerial combat. There is no other airplane like it. Mickey T and I were lucky enough to fly. We're going to be lucky enough to remember how awesome we were together with the rest of the Luke gang here in a, in a few months. Uh, and we could go on forever, but we'll wait and do that over a cold adult beverage in Arizona. Mickey T, thanks much. Uh, what's your next figment? What's the next thing you want to do? A whole one like I had February of last year? Or what's what's I, on your yeah, list? I think I'm, I'm to that point in my uh, career where it's uh, enjoy life a little bit. I got two grandkids, but you yeah. know, enjoy the golf course a little bit more. Maybe get a hole in one or just get to spend <laughs> time with good people like we are with our reunion or go out with some of the yeah. old guys and play some golf and talk about old times and enjoy life while I can. Well, great. Best to you, Steph, kids, grandkids, and uh, I'll see you in Arizona. Um, what would Fig do? As Fingers asked me to, to mention in one of our early episodes, what Fig would do is Max perform the ever living crap out of your jet in your life. Okay, go for it and then live with the consequences and recover. Thanks, Mickey T. It's been a pleasure. Folks, yeah. thank you for joining me on Figments, the power of imagination. Here on Think Tech Hawaii. Think Tech Hawaii is a nonprofit corporation that does great work getting citizen journalists like me in front of the crowd. So Watch it, and don't forget to click like on this episode. Aloha.
Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.